The following interview was conducted with Carolyn Gary for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November the 5th, 2007 in Stewart Center Television uh, Studio. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and parents and siblings and early year school years. All right, Katie. Well, <clears throat> I was born in Seattle, Washington. I'm a war baby. And my parents moved to Lafayette in the spring of 46. And uh, dad got an offer with the Stewart firm and he became a, a partner there. And we lived, quote, here all our lives. He, they are my parents are still living. Um, I, had a bro I have a brother and a sister. And uh, my sister and I both left the community at college age and both have returned and make, has made this our home. Um, after my graduation from Purdue, did I you go to high school? Tell about West school. Lafayette High School. Uh, Where did you go to grade school? I went. I actually was in the Purdue child care program, and then went to grade school at Morton Elementary, okay. and uh, then o to Burtsfield. They opened that quote new school, and then on to West Lafayette, and then I graduated from Purdue. When would you graduate from In 69, okay. in uh, December of 69, when they didn't have the uh, ceremonies. And moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and taught school briefly, and then took a job uh, at the Atlanta Merchandise Mart. And was there about three and a half years as director of marketing, which the elementary school and marketing, you know, in those days you, everyone, I guess, at least females, were in nursing or education. But I really enjoyed the marketing. Uh, and I love the big city, you know, coming from a smaller community, I, I spread my wings, but then chose to decide to come back to a small town. And I picked a couple, and I interviewed first here, uh, and the University Development Office was one of the offers I got through the community. I got I had another offer from Purdue, and I really liked the person that was hiring and he was a Purdue grad and he had just been hired by Dr. Hansen to start this new university development program uh, with Purdue and he had a lot of fundraising experience and development experience and he was hired not just to raise money but to establish a program of outreach. So I accepted the job and started in October of 1972 at Purdue. And at the time, Dr. Hansen had been hired not only to be obviously the university president, but like all boards, they gave him some, some strategic uh, goals. And one of those was to bring back a sense of uh, relationships and trust and communication with, between student and the university, obviously the faculty, alumni, and the public, the general feeling of what our role was. So at that time, we started a giving program, and that was the President's Council, but we also started Purdue Perspective, a parents program, a telephone program where we called and asked for money. And this really was a cultural shift for the university. Uh, not that people were against us, they just didn't think people would give. They understood that it was good for public relations to be talking about needs, but it was very strange for administrators and alumni to, to make this shift. Uh, when I started, I was a very young female administrator, and there were several key people that made me reasonably accepted to the outside. One was the Alumni Association Executive Director, Joe Rudolph, and then the head of the Alumni uh, Foundation, uh, Dick Thornton. Those two individuals said, this really is important to Purdue. We've spent all our life trying to promote alumni relations, and these people are trying to do good for Purdue. And that support really did help break down some barriers and open some doors. The first real program we started uh, with Dr. Hansen was the President's Council. We needed a leadership group of people that were respected that would reach out and say, come on, let's get on board and help the university. Through Joe Rudolph and several others, we developed our list of the first people we would go out and ask. But we needed leadership 
and we asked an individual who really had been a major player in industry, also in the Chicago uh, mid Midwest, and that was Gene Berg. He was chairman of the board and president of Bucyrus Erie. M engineer, and he was well connected. Uh, I remember the day very well when we went up and asked him. Mark Hansen had called him, and he said, I'll be glad to talk to them. And so we went up, and he said, I'll do it. We will help. And we explained what we were starting. Really, it was $1,000 a year, or for those who had been giving uh, 100000 in, in a longer term. And those were the two levels of membership. But how do you get something like that started nationally? And what he did was pick up the phone and call some of his fraternity friends and his corporate friends and friends from Purdue. And he picked, obviously, corporate leaders. And then we'd fly to New York, and someone key there would have host the party, if you will, a gathering. And Dr. Hansen would talk about what our needs were. And we went through this city by city. Um, one person who helped a great deal was Earl Butts. He agreed to use his name, and he was had been Secretary of Agriculture at some period of that, but during that he helped us and would talk about Purdue and the need for that. And Byron Anderson, uh, an early alum and a trustee, very involved with the Alumni Association, he became our membership chair. So we had people that understood the need but again, it was uncomfortable for people to be asked. After about 20 years, everyone save one name on that original list joined the council at varying levels. And I was very proud of that, and so was Dr. Hansen. Uh, but we had good people who understood the need to connect and were willing to step out uh, for the council and knew that this was important. And we had just come off the first capital campaign that Earl Butts had been um, uh, heading up under Dr. Hubdy. So the idea of giving was at least recognized as important, and they did a great deal of stewardship then. But then we started in about getting together. And the early probably five, ten years of certainly Dr. Hansen, he held what we called a roundtable discussion. And every fall before a meeting of the council, and whatever programming we had at that point, they always could have breakfast with him. And because the membership was small, we'd sit actually upstairs in one of the Stewart Center rooms, and he would be open to any questions. So that dialogue was very important, and the Anywhere idea that, that you wanted to, besides giving money, we really were sending the message we needed their involvement. And that came, and many of those people have been major volunteers, major donors, but really good stewards of the importance of being involved at the university. Mm -hmm. So that that was great, and um, and then of course when Dr. Bering came, uh, he was here almost 18 and a half, 19 years. Uh, he felt the same way, and he did a lot of traveling to grow the council. Uh, and really spent a, a lot of effort trying to get people involved. And through the Alumni Association programs, we would piggyback visits with the president with, we might have a, a small meeting of council members, there might be 30 or 40 in a given city, and then we'd follow that with a dinner with all the alumni in the area. Sure, right. And if the Glee Club came or the Purdueettes, we had good attendance always. Right. So. Let me ask you this for the researchers. Well, prior to the President's Council, there had been some development. What, Just uh, in retrospect, you might want to share that. Sure. Um, the Alumni Association was the only game in town. And this is not unique to Purdue, but that was true uh, at most universities, especially with grant land grant. The Alumni Association uh, had a trust developed, and that was the Purdue Alumni Foundation. And they did fundraising annually for an annual gift and they raised to the alumni, money to the foundation. Alumni, yes, and they gave out this, the uh, teaching awards and some scholarship monies. But that was all the real fundraising, and it was not managed by the university. If you look at the Big Ten today and 35 years ago, uh, some are within the, the university. We are, but our sister school in Indiana has a separate uh, foundation and still does. 
So it was how Purdue wanted to manage sure. that, and it was decided uh, with where we were and how they wanted to do it that it would be within the university. Framework within the university. Mm -hmm. But the John Purdue Club ex existed, though, didn't John it? Purdue Club was started in 1957, and again, my dad, George Schilling, Red Mackey, Joe Rudolph, and there was one other guy in the room, my dad was the attorney for the uh, board, uh, sat down and established the John Purdue Club. And that was the first giving club, if you will, for Purdue. And then you go to 1972 and then the council started. So uh, it was uh, rightfully the way to do it for Purdue for, for, for athletics. But we were probably 20, 25 years behind, let's say, University of Michigan. Uh, Iowa, Illinois, we were sort of in within that five-year framework. All of the universities were really getting a handle on because the needs were growing in terms of outside uh, gift support. All right, very good. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about but the, the membership has grown and then there's different levels within there. You want right. to well, mention that? Well, the, uh, the first two levels, as I mentioned, a thousand and a hundred thousand, but as time progressed, and encouraging new levels, we went from a thousand. Then we had a ten thousand for you know a thousand per year. Then we went to twenty five thousand, and a hundred thousand, half a million, and then in just about I guess it would have been just before Dr. Jiski came, we added the million dollar level called the Pinnacle, and so. Over time, you know, we've had a range of things, but the whole idea is to raise the bar to encourage people to be thinking uh, of giving, and particularly the whole concept of deferred giving. Um, after, I think it would have been in 75 or 76, uh, we hired a plan giving officer who in turn hired Gordon Chavers, who was his uh, general counsel to the development office, and he's headed up that whole right. plan giving program. And that was also recognized. Besides annual gifts, we wanted people to be considered you know, good doing something uh, later, either through a trust or through a will. And that has certainly gained popularity, and they've marketed that program much more intensely as time has gone on, as the needs have gotten greater. So, sure. right, okay. There were a couple of programs. That plan for the '80s was that was that was that was, that was, a, that was that? a campaign program. Purdue had the plan for the '80s right. after the Centennial campaign. That was that under was Hubby, Dr. Hubby right. and plan for the '80s. Then Vision 21 under Dr. Beering. There were two capital campaigns, and then this campaign for sure. Purdue. So in the course of 35 years, we've had four campaigns. And if you, I remember a dean of one of our distinguished colleges, I talked to him about meeting about fundraising, and he looked at me and said, if you can talk to me about $10 million, I'll talk to you. Well, of course, when I asked him that question, we weren't in the $10 million. Today, we are. But the, the needs have changed so drastically in terms of what, how money comes to the university. And the pot has gotten smaller from the state. And if we were to grow, there was no other way but to go to sure. private donations. So the department, when I first started, I remember going home and telling dad uh, what I had decided. Mom and dad were sitting in the den. And they said, well, which offer have you accepted? And I said, this development officer, and he says, you are going to be a part of an empire. And he's right. I mean, he was right. I mean, when, but time, you know, if you're at 26, you don't see this <laughs> as you do Not if you've been really. there. No, but, uh, and, and we will always be a major part in terms of n the need to go out and have corporate partnerships. Uh, we want them to hire our grads. They invest in us. Uh, there's a two and there's a give and take there and individuals highly look at private giving and particularly education as uh, an investment in the future so we're going to have money and as long as we're good at d developing those relationships and maintaining them we're going to sure. always be asking um, now that you mentioned that back to campus that how did that right. come about that well and that's been in the early, yeah, we started that, I'm going to say, about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, 
You said around 86, uh, right. some of the research that I had done. One of the problems when we first started, there was a lack of understanding of what all this meant. And we would have programs, and we'd have a time with the president, right we'd have a big dinner and, and a program, but we needed to have more guts to what we were about to educate and inform. So we used to have symposiums on a variety of subjects. I remember one well was the in energy symposium, and it sounds like the context could be as it is today. We had the Secretary of Transportation there, Ralph Bailey, one of our distinguished alums, who was then chair of Conoco, which became Conoco DuPont, which is now Conoco, I don't know, whatever. But he, uh, they had about five people on there, and it was a whole day seminar, and we did that. We did food as a crisis, energy as a crisis. The only problem after three or four or five years of this was that not all schools could participate. And obviously, the program should involve as much of the university as possible. So what we did, decided to do was to offer the opportunity back to class. And so the schools would then put forth and write up what they wanted. And we basically told them, market it as if it was going to be on the front page of the USA Today. In other words, what's important and then how are we reaching uh, something that you really would be proud to talk about later. It could be research, but it, the solution, the practical uh, land-grant concept is how are we helping people today, and, and that caught on. And it's been sustained, I think, the program, I've been out of it about three years. They've done a really fine job of working that program through, and now we not only have it on the campus in the fall, we take it to Naples, Florida in the winter. And so, you know, and uh, who knows what the future sure. will hold. But it is a, the same concept is if you're going to ask for money, you want them to be involved and informed and proud of the institution that they're giving to. And when you've been to back to class for a day, you come out of that just so excited about the faculty that are teaching, the fact that coursework is at this level, or the researcher, or you come back and you learn something that you really want to learn. Right. So it's it's a great program. Right. And you learn more by it. it's one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, yes. Really what it is, where, where you can have brochures and things of that sort. But what you're saying, I've heard from people who've gone to them. We've, we've done a few over time, too. Yeah. Which is and really and really also, I, I would say that uh, one of the things we tried to do, which wasn't always practical, we tried to get them into the classrooms. Uh, we have, you know, all this last 10 years, a lot of new buildings, but we have some older buildings and some older labs. Okay. And they need to appreciate the fact that when we say we need something new to keep our kids uh, current in whatever field they're studying, they might have seen a few of those labs that needed updating. So, you know, yeah, good thought. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some of the awards, the Sagamore and Distinguished Service Awards, some of the awards that the councils give, how those came about. And <coughs> well, share the, with the us. earliest awards were the Distinguished Service Awards, and it was established we would do internal and external. We uh, had a group, usually it was a chair and the president and a few volunteers, but we would select individuals or program groups within the university to thank them because, as we all know, there is a lot of inner support for what you're trying to do, whether it was the Glee Club or Purdue Marketing. One year the union got it, but the effort that they'd made to, to make our programming uh, special, uh, and individuals. But most of it was outside. Who had been, what alums or friends had helped the council program. It could have been a volunteer leader, and we did many of those, but we also looked for people that had stepped up and, and helped uh, grow the program. We asked the governors over a period of time for the highest honor that our state can give because we felt and they concurred that these leaders were exceptionally uh, helpful to the state of Indiana. Uh, yes. And so up until just a few years ago, we almost every 10 years would ask for those people to be honored with that. And that has, had been done up through Governor O'Bannon mm -hmm. on the 30th. And I, of course, I don't know if they'll ask on the 40th or whatever, but we'll see. So. 
And you got an ambassador of the year, and also one of the new ones that was in 97, the silver ambassador, and one of the recipients, the first one was Ed Elliott. He was the only one that was given that award. Do they no uh, longer give it, or was that? It was on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the council, and we looked back and selected the one person who had been probably done the most substantial good, other than a chair, if you will, leader, and Ed was it. I mean, Ed Elliott was everything to Purdue, and uh, he was always there to support a, you know, a program, always there to be generous, um, but just uh, his spirit was truly the best of the best, and that, that was given uh, then. They have done a lot of, uh, through this last campaign, giving the Pinnacle Award, which was started under Dr. Jiski, that is the highest level of giving, and so we called it the President's Council Pinnacle Award, and they've done that for those who have exceeded a gift of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, how is the, no, no, uh, the um, nomination or selection process, how does that come about? Is it the council this the size as a group, or is it the officers, or how? Well, it, uh, it varied okay. over, over time. Uh, a lot of times it was within the development side, and, and I would maybe would talk to the chair, and we would come up with some names that we'd ask colleagues who had been helpful, because as the program grew, fundraisers were hired within the schools, and, and they were the ones that would know. And then we would take it to the president and ask him, and uh, he or, you know, now she would, would uh, make that decision. Uh, we had over time a variety of advisory boards within the council. Under Dr. Hansen, we had quite a few. And then during Beering's time, we had one, but because there were two campaigns, the campaign committees did a lot of the same type of thing. So we were, worked more on program in those years for an advisory board. And then under Jiski, we've had a volunteer group, and that has continued and grown, and I think will grow in the future as an advisory board, which mm -hmm. I think is great for the council program. It's an advisory board for the mm -hmm. President's mm -hmm. Council? Mm -hmm. Okay, is it going to be members? Or are they oh, yeah. Have to be members? Oh, yeah, and young members, too. Okay. Uh, we've, they, we've encouraged the what I call the generation of the under 40, uh, because they are the future of, of leadership as alums to the university and trying to get more of them involved and also over the period of time we had focus groups you know I can remember the 15 years ago 20 years ago 20 asking members what do you want what do we need to be doing and how can we improve our publications if you took the publications to the council over the course of time lots of changes Obviously, whoever was leading the development program and or the president would make those suggestions and changes, and it's gotten better, Yeah, a lot and better. Uh, you, um, did, how did it travel? You go around, they go around a lot of... Well, uh, it depended on which presidency and uh, the needs of the time of development. Under the most travel, uh, big time travel, was under the Bearings, because they had two major campaigns. And we might go to, in terms of cities, eight to ten a year and take, you know, the Glee Club. And we call uh, the worst trip was the Rust Belt trip on the bus. That was the last time I think Dr. Beering went with us on the bus. But five or six days on the back is not good of anybody over 50. So, but he was a good sport. Uh, <laughs> but we did group travel. In other words, uh, we took the group and we'd go to five cities. And, of course, a lot of times it would be spring break when we could take the Glee Club or Purduettes. Or like the Rust Belt, that was, you know, Milwaukee, Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and so forth. But went up the East Coast, uh, and, of course, we did a lot of Florida. So uh, Arizona, uh, we were going to where people were that we wanted to focus on, right. and, that's, and that's where we did it. Now, um, Dr. Jiski did uh, quite a few cities. And this last, I think this upcoming year, they have maybe three or four cities mm -hmm. that they're planning. Did you also, you went outside the United States as well, didn't they? The or President's you? Council, um, I always admired what the Alumni Association did. And early on, uh, under Dr. Hansen's uh, administration, we went to him with an idea. How about if we take and invite just our membership 
on a trip with you and your wife. That way we have we have them <laughs> uh, together and they get to know the president in a s more personal, uh, just a social setting. They pay their way. Uh, it was nothing out of uh, our budget and uh, how about it? And so I went to then, uh, of course, Joe Rudolph to get advice and I we worked with a Chicago firm that was the best at that time and probably still is in alumni travel. But they had never done one for the high-end donor group. And so we marketed it to the council and we worked with them to make it more special, if you will. The, their trips were always high, highly received by the group. And over the course of time, in the, uh, uh, Hanson years, it was every three years. And then we went to every two years during the bearing, and it's continued every two years. And it has proven to be a wonderful means of getting a group together that they became friends. I mean, there were people who never would have known each other without that trip. And it, it was truly, you know, we've talked about Purdue family, but they're really, you could see it. Um, and it was nobody was being asked for dollars. It was strictly we're Purdue President's Council members and we want to travel with our president. And it's as a it's family. Been, as a family. Yeah. And we mainly Europe. Uh, and then during the bearing years, we did weekends with Steve and Jane. And if we've done a couple uh, with the Jiskies focused. One was for engineering and, and uh, one went to American Club in Kohler, Wisconsin. And those two were very nice short trips that a select group were invited to and uh, made a lot of golf, you know, but it was a time to be together and it worked yeah. out well. And it, it brought the, the council even more closely because they get to, you get to interact people right. with people. You mentioned, you did mention that phonathon. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that and where. Well, the phonathon yeah. was um, started in not the first year, it was probably 76, and uh, we held it. The first night was to be in January in Andre Potter, third floor, that had not been completed. It was just cement in the building. And of course, that was the first major snowstorm that, <laughs> that we had. So we were, uh, we delayed one day and had it started the next. But we used volunteers, students, who were part of our council for special events. And we probably had 30 callers. And it was maybe, you know, in the course of four nights or five nights. We went down to IU actually and looked at how they did their phone program and of course many of them were volunteer at the time and then as the sophistication and fundraising it grew, we grew and now it is a year-round program uh, and paid students who are wonderful and they, they can supplement their uh, needs for school uh, funds and they work uh, usually from like five or six in the evening to eight or nine and uh, they can do some weekend calling. Well, it's terrific. It's a great program and it brings in a lot of money for the university. It probably touches base with people that may, it's oh, another avenue. Oh, absolutely. Another and avenue uh, they're not being t contacted. Right, uh, right. And it's good. been, been yeah. helpful. What, uh, the campaign for Purdue and the President's Council work pretty closely together, Absolutely, right? yeah, absolutely. And the program of the council is the, is the people side and then with the leadership, on, like under Dr. Jiske, we had a marvelous group of people who were the campaign advisory board and they, they helped put the whole program together. But a lot of events, all the fall pregame events and now the 10 events we've been doing about four or five years uh, before pregames, are all council members, they socialize, and we then at those events recognize these wonderful people who've done these wonderful things, whether it's a, a chair or a building or whatever, the, the events are. Gives you that opportunity to do absolutely. that. Right, yeah. You mentioned on the road. Tell us about the Amelia Earhart Scholarship. Uh, I, I, 
for the researchers because of the collection that's in the archives and special collection of Amelia Earhart, including the Chapman gift, which right. uh, came several years ago. Well, it, uh, it was an interesting story how one thing touches another. Um, a woman who was a student here got a call when she was a student that she was a recipient of Amelia Earhart scholarship. She didn't know how she got it, and she, to this day, Doris couldn't tell you. And so she, you know, was appreciative of that funding, and she, I know she had other scholarships. So then you fast forward about 30 years, and her daughter was thinking about coming to Purdue, and she decided, they have done so much for me, I'm going to join the council, which she did. And in the council program, for the fall that she was coming back was this back to class program and one of the offerings was the Amelia Earhart collection. So she went to that and she was so excited and she thought, you know, I want to give to the scholarship fund that helped me. So she mentioned it to Dr. Beering and he said, well, you call Carolyn Gary and she'll help you. Well, I started researching and we couldn't find an Amelia Earhart scholarship. It had dried up. It was, it was may have been just a one time or several years. So I called her and told her and she said, well, let's start one. And that's how that all came about. And then I got the fun job of asking individuals for that. We did mailings. Ed Elliott, several other people who had known Amelia wanted to support that. And it was a fun program and of course the library moved forward too in their fundraising and with those connections with the Chapman family uh, a huge collection came which was made everyone happy about that uh, and I hope that the scholarship grows I mean with time uh, we got a great fundraiser in the libraries and and the collection brings a lot of right. interest to the campus I, I from what I understand it's one of the best in the country and uh, it is we're very it's growing right that's right so so, but here was a full circle from a student experience all the way to alum and a parent experience. Uh, and it turned out one of the recipients of that scholarship was the daughter of one of uh, Doris's, um, was her roommate at, in college. So, you know, they can saw, say small world, but <laughs> it really, really is. is. Uh, uh, when you look back on the President's Council, what are some of the uh, things in retrospect that you would you care to share anything particular on that? How it's grown or um, some of your challenges you were able to meet? Sure. Yeah. Well, the, the, one of the biggest was the issue of a cultural change on people asking. And even this week, uh, you can talk to an, an alum and they'll tell you, oh, I don't like to ask for money. Um, we have to ask for money. And the council was sort of the face of the institution's pride, uh, the thank you for people recognizing them because we had this group of people who were donors and had levels and the university raised that up as an important element uh, to, to the university. Every president recognized at differing need levels and Dr. Jiske of course during his tenure giving was paramount to moving forward, but it was either stay here or m play with the big boys, and Purdue made that decision to, right. to try to get in the game, if you will. It's a fine institution, but much better. And uh, this next president, we're going to have to continue that. Uh, uh, different directions, different strategies, different strategic plans, but the council was always the face of development because if you look back in 72 development started in the same year the council was a program of development and so was the phonathon so was the parents program so was deferred giving but the council was that picture it was the, the yeah. face of it well said. Uh, right and um, I hope that we always send the message that giving is important and appreciated and the personal relationship with the members, I mean, it's hard. There are over 1,700 members now, or 17,000, excuse me. Um, 
but you still can convey that in right. various ways. Right. And uh, by one of the, many of the local things and the one-on-one -on -one and the people coming back, and there are ways to meet exactly. them and meet and greet. Exactly. Right. And yeah. that's and important. you served over several presidents, haven't yes. you? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, knowing Dr. Hovde as a student, and then when I first was hired, he and I were working in the same building, and he was um, truly a gentleman and a scholar, but a very kind person. So over a five year, you know, five presidents, and I'm sort of excited the fact that my last year as an employee uh, will be a woman who never, you wouldn't have dreamed that a woman would be there, and such a gracious one, uh, and so focused on people and staff and right. along. Yeah. So. You got a couple of awards to, uh, that I'd like to, one was the, um, your honorary member of the Purdue Foundation Student Board. Mm -hmm. And for the 25th year, they gave you the symbolic chair, which the council did. Yes. How did that, what, what, react, what was your reaction on that? Well, I was surprised. I mean, uh, the student group was very personal because you work with this marvelous group of people and over the course of these 35 years, we had different names, but the Purdue Foundation Student Board was from the 80s, so it's the longest named organization. And um, not everybody got it, and it meant a lot that the students wanted to say thank you for what you're doing, and we're glad we're part of development. And, and uh, they were key at, at our, many of our events, and the use of them today in all the events that Purdue has, they just are very, very busy, and, and um, it, was, it was nice. It very was receptive, very nice. too. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you got that recognition for the 30 years of service to the council. That's really very nice. Did, uh, did they catch you unaware? Yes. It was a surprise. Uh, the thing that meant the most was the inscription on, they did a piece of paper where everybody that had been a chair signed it. And that, that was... That's kind of really oh, special. Yeah. yeah. Now the box of the gift was that beautiful blue from Tiffany. So I knew whatever it was, it was from Tiffany. So that meant <laughs> something else for at least any woman would appreciate that. But... Uh, no, and I think probably the other honor that meant a lot to me, uh, Dr. Beering um, had asked me publicly to come to the podium at one of the PC events after I had introduced him, and it was after uh, Vision 21, and he presented the President's Medal to me, which, of course, I was going through pictures this weekend sorting out stuff and came across that, and that meant a lot. Um, but he. He was exceptionally thoughtful and personal, as, as was Jane, and sending a little note or a little picture or whatever, and uh, that meant a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Have you been, have been active in the, uh, as an alum, in the alumni at all, at being a Purdue grad? Um, I'm a life member. Sure. Um, I do you know, alumni events, but my professional life and it's private life was, it was sort of I was there, but I was there in a professional way, yeah. if that makes sense. How about uh, traditions? You got a favorite Purdue tradition? Anyone that comes to your mind that you think well, about being a Purdue grad? Um, I'm, I'm an honorary member of Reamers, and I think probably the Boilermaker Special <laughs> is one of my favorite programs or uh, activities, because you can see that, you can touch it, you can it's there at all the special events, and it just says Purdue. Uh, when we built the Dalk Center, that was one of the other projects that was most, uh, I was honored to have it in terms of designing it and, and doing the building, but the most fun was to put all of that together in the hall and doing those traditions. You helped me with, with sure. a lot of the decisions on that. And, and the Boilermaker Special, is that says Purdue. I mean, besides our astronauts, Anybody knows that, and that tradition and having it there at all the w events and our bowl games and all that. That's right. Have you gone to many of the bowl games too? Yep, yep. First and our most recent Rose Bowl, I was there, <laughs> and uh, that was special. We'll hope, we'll hope yeah. again this year. Um, an outstanding event in your life. Got one that you'd like to share with us? Other than the birth of my son Michael and my marriage to my husband. Um, probably was the, uh, that's hard to pinpoint, but I guess the, the, the last of the reunions to under Dr. Beering of the astronauts. Um, 
I just reminded, uh, as we just dedicated all this this weekend, and I was there uh, as an alum, not as a staff member, I went up to Dave Wolf, who now has gray hair, and he was a member of our student group that helped us with those early phonathons. And I said, Dave, do you remember me? And, oh yeah. And I said, well, do you remember what you asked me? And it was 1986, I think about who to introduce you to, and he, no, and I said, you asked me to introduce you to Neil Armstrong. And I was so touched. Here is this, ast another astronaut asking to talk to the big person, of course, and Neil is gracious as he is, but planning that event, because that's part of what we did. We didn't have a special events office, and working with the astronauts, as far as an alum and to know Neil Armstrong, you know, he's the icon of Purdue. It's a sort of a point of the pinnacle of all that Purdue is because they're quality people, they're down to earth, there's no pretense, and they were our stars. And so to be a part of that, they would come to council, the council events plus other things. But that was, you know, probably one of the highlights. Yeah, there are many, good. but. Any questions that you'd like to ask that were not asked or any comment, general things that you'd like to share? Mm -hmm. You got uh, some plans for the, well, you were saying earlier that you're going to be moving on after in 08. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I, my husband and I will be here, we'll retire to the community, we'll be active with Purdue. That's part of the reason we stay. Um, to live in a community of, of uh, university like Purdue, and of course it's home, um, is really important. I, you know, I look back of when my folks were here, and if you, I've seen enough of the newsreels, they still are, you know, we see them, um, how things change and how they remain the same. The words about Purdue, the pride, the hail Purdue, all those words are the same, but the face, what goes on in the classroom, what is the product of the research, that all changes. But the uh, ethics, and work model hasn't. And that's what I guess if you look, I look at these young council members that were young when I started and now they're uh, in their 80s, uh, the, the new and the old haven't changed. I mean, they, and that I guess is probably an observation that I've made. And I think most of us who've been around it have seen that. Um, Dr. Beering, did something I thought was very important as a leader, and he did this obviously with many council members. Um, he gave them what he called the Minuteman pen. It was a seal of the university. And it was acknowledgement of their help, their support. He honored, did the honorary degree of the gold. He did the solid gold uh, for all honorary degrees and went back and did that. Those small symbolic gestures. I hope we all continue. Um, they don't Didn't have they to be do the banners that they carry at the commencement. Yes. Wasn't it? Yeah. And I think as we move forward, I hope traditions are reinvented, new ones begun, uh, the wonderful railroad tracks that were started this last year, two years ago. That's wonderful. But to see in the ballrooms this two weeks ago, the senior chords coming back and all of that. That kind of, I hope that continues with new people, new ideas. Sure. Um, I hope the council programs change and improve because they have to if we're going to stay there. But that the people touch doesn't. All right. And that's what's key. Yeah. I think. Okay. Please. Thank you very much, Carolyn. My pleasure for the opportunity to interview you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <clears throat>